Hello, everybody. Welcome to the next installment of the Hathor material. As I said last week, this is my favorite part of the Hathor material. We are in the addendum. So we are at the back of the book where we're going through some of the history, some of the mystery around the Hathors and our ancient history that we know is... Uh, Maybe not what we've been told. And so if you missed last week's edition of the Hathor material, I will place that down in the description box below. Of course, all the other segments of the Hathor material before this week could probably be looked at ind as independent subject material, but this addendum is leading one onto the next. We left off last week. We Our last week we covered last week was the missing planet of Maldek, which I am by the way, researching off camera to possibly do a show on, depending on how much information is available. And today we are going to be talking about or starting with the pyramids. The Hathors say, so again, this is the Hathors, this group of celestial beings who teach through an Egyptian modality of understanding. They're the ones being channeled for this work. So they say, we had no nothing to do with the building of the pyramids, but they were not merely burial chambers, as some of your historians and archaeologists believe. We know that. We know that, right? Although many of the pyramids did actually have burial chambers within them, their primary function was as oscillators of energy. And because the sides of the pyramids were burnished, often with a highly polished granite, they would cause the pyramid to oscillate energetically. Initiates would enter the pyramids in designated areas that were laid out in specific mathematical rotations. This permitted them to receive understanding of the great universe and the great mystery that they could not have achieved if they were not in such a matrix of energy. This was one level of their function, which we do understand. In fact, the pyramid design is a very important spiritual design. And we do know that the bad guys, the, the, the dark ones, have manipulated the pyramid. We do know that. And again, as I will say, I'm terrified at the vigilante attitude that's coming out of a lot of truthers. The dark can't create anything, guys. The Let me say that again. For those in the back who maybe didn't hear, the dark cannot create anything. They can't create anything. Only the light can create. The only thing the dark does is it steals from the light and inverts it, or it tries to mimic the light. Believing that the controllers created things such as pyramids is giving the darkness way too much power. The darkness cannot create anything. It is our job to take back what is ours. If we got rid of everything the darkness had corrupted, we would have nothing left. So pyramids were good things. The law of one states that, Ra states that these celestial beings actually came down to try to teach humanity through shapes, through the shape of the pyramid. And they call themselves the sons and daughters of sorrow because the bad guys took the pyramid and inverted it. So they feel bad that the darkness did that to us because it was a creation of the light, okay? And it is an oscillator of energy. That's why I have so many pyramids around my house. And in the front room, I have pyramids as well. Our yoga studio, we have pyramids. It's because they oscillate energy. The human body itself works as a pyramid, going with energy coming up through Shashumna. So with that being said, be careful about what you say you want to get rid of. Because if you think you want to get rid of the pyramids because the darkness uses it, you're talking about your own body too. Another function of the pyramids was energetic. The pyramids were installed in specific mathematical rotations to facilitate the creation of a grid work. We know that a lot of the pyramids we have today are, are on the constellation of Orion's belt, but it is my opinion, I know a lot of people share this opinion, that the pyramids we see in Egypt today were not originally placed there. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm referring to Tartaria. And there is a great channel out there. There's lots of channels out there that's specifically focused on Tartaria. And if we're looking at the specific focus of Tartaria along with the ancient maps, that would make the real Egypt where I live in the southeastern part of the United States, making the Mississippi the Nile River. 
And from what I understand, for people who work in Atlanta and have been, been here for a while, there are actually pyramids in Atlanta underground. They've been buried underground. So take with that what you will. This energetic grid work on the planet was laid out to express purpose of holding the next grid, what is now called the Christ grid by some. When Christ entered into his work, the grid was established by the pyramid supporting the new vibration and the vibrational Christ grid continues to strengthen to this day. So the pyramids were multi-level and multi-purpose devices, which makes sense because we know that Yeshua, that the matrix calls Jesus, Yeshua and Magdalene were Egyptian. They were not Jewish. They were Egyptian. So they would have been very familiar with the work of pyramids. Other pyramids were established around the planet, but it is not done by one specific civilization. It was done by many different civilizations, but all beings and civilizations that participated in their construction were deeply connected through their intuition and their understanding of the great mystery. And they understood energetically what they were doing, but there was no joining together under one chief architect nor was there a meeting of chief architects in the in time and three-dimensional space. These ancient architects also had outside help from intergalactic visitors, such as the Acturians, Andromedians, Palladians, and Syrians, among others. The Hathor Temples. There was an ancient understanding that the source, the mystery, expressed itself through the four elements. The air was the element most associated with the divine. You need to understand that as primitive humans contemplated their reality, i.e. being earthbound and dealing with three-dimensional reality, it seemed as if the gods came from above, from the sky realm. So they associated the divine with the sky. Hathor in her first manifestation was the sky goddess. It was later that the Egyptians associated with her, for, with her fertility. Thus, the first goddess of the Egyptian pantheon, before the time of pharaohs, went through a metamorphosis in the minds of the people. At first, she was associated with the element of air, the sky, and during this period, she was seen as the manifestation of divine love and ecstasy. Then she became associated with fertility and the earth. It was also during this later manifestation that she became associated with sex and joy. Love and ecstasy continued to be associated with her as well. The work of the priestess and the priests in the temples of Hathor had a dual nature. They were often asked to influence fertility and affect good births. This was the outer work of the temple. The esoteric or hidden work of the temple was the use of alchemy, which involved the raising up of the initiate sexual energy to the higher energy centers of the body. The priestess and priests will wear well versed in this esoteric science and much of what you call Tantra can be traced back to these roots. And we did, if you join us for the Magdalene manuscript, which was also channeled by Tom Kenyon, Magdalene herself spoke a lot about this. She was a high priestess in the priestesshood of Isis, as was Yahshua. He was a priest. Isis, back then, was spelled E-S-S-E, -S -S -E, the Essenes. That's why in the Bible, the Essenes are so drastically different from the Pharisees and the Sadducees, because they're not Jewish. They were Egyptian. They practice Egyptian rituals and rites. Yes, Yahshua and Magdalene had Jewish students. They called him rabbi or teacher, but they themselves make no mistake. They themselves were Egyptian. The Egyptian pantheon. Egyptian deities such as Isis and Osiris, Osiris etc., would best be described in your terminology as force-filled or energy patterns of awareness possessing vast consciousness. These energies were then anthropomorphized by humans in the Egyptian period. So the Egyptian pantheon is actually a picture, if you will, of force fields that move through the universe. We would therefore encourage you in these modern times not to take Egyptian pantheon literally for the little understanding was given to the lesser minds of the period. I actually disagree with this and I've said this before because this is being channeled by Tom Kenyon. And what we have to understand with channeling is that the channel or the person doing the channeling is meeting the information where the person is in their own understanding. And that's why I think Tom Kenyon does not understand the reality of the situation. I know he knows that Magdalene and Yahshua were Egyptian, but he doesn't understand about Tartaria, nor does he understand that Yahshua was never crucified. He doesn't understand that. And granted, two years ago, I wouldn't have understood it either. Um, 
I do believe that Isis was a person who actually lived, as was Osiris, as was Hathor. I think these people actually lived. Um, and their legend became that of a deity, what we would perceive as a deity. Their story became greater and greater and greater over time. Understand instead that all the teachings are on multiple levels so that what was taken literally by the less evolved consciousness of earlier times was understood by the high priestess as a priest to be symbolic of energy force fields. And with that being said, I mean, we see this with the Emerald Tablets, with the chakras, they talk about the human being being force filled. So even if someone did live on this earth, their energy force field can still be very much alive and well in other generations. And you can take the lessons. So you can take the lessons taught by Magdalene and Yahshua to save yourself, to raise your own Kundalini, your own Christ consciousness. You can take the lessons of Isis and Osiris for your own resurrection, if that makes sense. It is best to understand that these pantheon deities are benevolent forces that can be aligned with, but are not the ultimate source, which is without duality or polarity. I think we understand that. In terms of Egyptian history, our influence began before the time of the pharaohs, the time when the sky goddess was Hathor and the sky god was Horus. Our earliest influences in Egypt began around 10,000 BC. We have, however, worked with this planet prior to the Egyptian period. The Egyptian period is simply one cultural expression of the mystery. The mystery is transcultural and extends beyond all times and all places. So we work through those cultures and those belief systems that we encounter. As ascended beings, we are, are able to transverse wide areas and inter interact with numerous civilizations. At times, we may make contact with only a few individuals. At other times, as in ancient Egypt, we contact and work with thousands. Although some of the information we bring has been preserved in the Egyptian esoteric or hidden teachings, most of our knowledge has yet to be communicated to mankind. An alchemical key in the myth of Osiris. Again, Osiris was good. Any truther telling you that Osiris was bad is either extremely confused and still stuck in the web of programming from the cabal or works for the cabal always 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 do your own research do not take anybody's word for it don't take my word for it don't take anyone's word for it always do your own research you want to move and flip to the new timeline take your sovereignty back the resurrection myth of Osiris is very long and complex and is actually an alchemical key that describes how to attain the resurrection of consciousness. It is an instruction book or manual, but it is in a symbolic code. We wish to address one small aspect of this complex myth for the purpose of highlighting a psychic tension that exists for all persons as they rise up in consciousness. In this in story, this Osiris has a brother set who is a code for the serpent called Apopolis, the serpent of duality. Set. Set is deluded by the illusion of the world and seeks revenge against his brother Osiris. This occurs because Set is deluded by external events. In this case, the external event is the fact that his brother slept with his wife, Nephtites. Set refuses to forgive his brother and plots his murder. This makes him the evil one in the myth. And you know that um, there are a lot of military, high-ranking military officers who worship Set, the Temple of Set. I didn't know Cyrus slept with his brother's wife. That's pretty scandalous. In the myth, there is another code word, Horus, who is the son of the murdered Osiris. Horus is a symbolic figure with multiple meanings. He is the rightful heir to the throne, and he is also a representative of the goddess Mahat, who represents peace and carries the scales that weigh the heart of an initiate at the moment of death to determine whether or whether or not he or she will enter the heavenly world and must ascend into the underworld. We, I, I understand that, you know, in the sense that even though I do believe Isis, Osiris, these people actually did live and their stories became legends and became a greater force for teaching. I actually do get that, that these stories of death and resurrection, like Tammuz, even Jesus, are literally metaphors. Like no one died, right? It's, it's literally a metaphor of you going into your underworld and then resurrecting again to your own self, to your own consciousness. It's like Magdalene says, you cannot ascend until you descend first. 
We call that in modern language, shadow work. In the myth, the symbol, for, the symbol for that which is eternally omnipresent and ever peaceful is Mahet, which is the opposite of the serpent Apollos duality. So the myth of Osiris is the story of the battle, if you will, between Mahet and the serpent, between truth and illusion. This battle between truth and illusion via the figures of Mahet and the serpent take place beneath the surface, behind, if you will, the battle between Horus and his uncle Set. In the myth, Set, who is the brother of Osiris, cuts him into tiny pieces and sends them all over the world. This is the symbol of duality, the dualistic mind, which cuts things into pieces and scatters them instead of the holding the wholeness of the being. Interestingly enough, side note, the god Set is where we get the word sunset from the sun setting, the setting of the Horus. Learn that from one of our favorite icons and research jordan maxwell somebody actually told me that they remind that i reminded them of a younger female jordan maxwell and that was literally the best compliment i had ever gotten so to the person who said that to me thank you so much i that means a lot to me because jordan maxwell was part of my waking up process for sure i would have loved to have had a conversation with him he passed away recently but nonetheless we still have a lot of respect for jordan maxwell on this channel the myth is about the conflict between the two aspects. In the final stages of the myth, there is a being that emerges called Set Horus, whereby Set is joined with Horus as one being. The two are caught in a mortal combat, and it is not possible to see where Set begins and Horus ends. Horus is shown in his form as a hawk-headed human, and Set is shown as a dog-like head on human form. The alchemical understanding of this is that humans are joined in co-mixture of illusion and truth. It's like Thoth. We see Thoth as having a bird's head. I have a little, somebody sent me a little Thoth here because I love the Emerald Tablets. But we know Thoth himself was a real person. He did not, he had a, a head of a human. It's all metaphor with the way they do these, right? With the, the different heads in the Egyptian culture. It's not demonic. It's not demonic. Once again, for those in the back who can't seem to hear, or can't seem to get it into their head, Darkness can't create anything. By believing the darkness can create something, you are giving the darkness more power. It can't create anything. Only the light can. So this was seen as metaphor, not demonic. There is an animal nature of set, which is fundamentally and uh, reluctantly a refusal to, or to forgive or to release anger and jealousy. And it is these qualities that make him the demonic one in this mythology, right? It's the qualities. It's the metaphor. We all have that dual duality with, inside of us. Even though in the story, the serpent is seen as bad, the serpent is also seen as bad in the Christian story too. But Kundalini rising is also the rising of the serpent. Once the serpent rises, it, it transcends that duality. We want to rise the serpent not kill it because that's the transcendent of duality not dying to duality i hope that makes sense since horus is the one who is connected to the divine there is an aspect of all human that is both divine di divine and demonic exactly polarization what alchemy says what the myth says is that you must acknowledge the truth of where you are you have parts of your psychology that are unforgiving, jealous, petty, and anger-filled, just as you have parts that are uplifting, loving, and compassionate. The continuing question is this, which part will you come from? Will you choose to express your set nature or your Horus nature? They are both a part of you, and they are both available at any moment, because life is a continual decision that centers around which aspect you will choose to express. In the mystery schools of Egypt, the priests and priestesses would scan initiates to sense where they were coming from in terms of their morality. If an initiate was more like Seth and Horus, meaning he or she was reluctant to forgive, forgive, held patterns of jealousy and or anger, then he or she would not be allowed to access the inner teachings and the inner technologies because it would be dangerous to empower someone who was unbalanced like this. So the selections of students was conducted by the priest and priestess. It was the responsibility of the guardians of the mystery school to ascertain the moral qualities of the initiates. That process does not exist today in quite the same way because each individual must judge his or her own moral quality. Earth is now moving into a higher vibrationary field and everything is being stimulated, including both the set nature of individuals and their horse natures. For many humans now, their worst and their best natures are coming out as response to Earth's movement 
upward in vibration. Your life situation provides an opportunity, whether you're aware of it or not, to make a choice. You will respond to a situation through your set nature, through anger, through jealousy, through pettiness, through an unwillingness to forgive, or will you choose to respond to a situation from your horse nature, which is based on love and compassion, understanding and truth? Your emotional responses create your destiny and your future patterns that will unfold in your life. You may lay the road to heaven or hell brick by brick by the choices you make in your everyday life. That mirrors the law of one, which for most people who've been on this channel for a while, you have a, a bit of an understanding of the law of one. Pretty much it's either service to self or service to others, the, the path of life, light or the path of darkness. And they say, you know, law, law of one is very kind of nonchalant about it. They're like, they're both equal, equal paths of spirituality. It's your choice, dude. Like you just pick which one you want to pick, which, which choice, which path you want to go on. Eventually the service to self won't go as high as service to others or the light because the darkness is a fractal of the light. Their darkness would, would not exist without light. But anyway, again, do your own research. The law of one, it's great. You should get it, read it for yourself. You cannot ascertain your spiritual progress based on how your life is working externally. Some people believe if they do right things, their life will be perfect. They also believe that if something negative occurs, they have failed. This is not our understanding. Not my understanding either. Coming from um, an Eastern school of thought, from my studies in the East and in India, that's not my understanding either. Just because bad things happen to you does not mean that it's because it's like you're cursed, right? It's it's usually a, a karmic work that you kind of agreed to, to understand. Because again, the friction is what's needed. That friction is what's needed for growth. And friction only comes when something is uncomfortable, right? Uh, again, the match, you have a match, you have a matchbook, right? You, got, you pull a match out of a matchbook. That match on its own has everything it needs in it to light itself, but it can't light itself. In order for that light to shine from the match, it has to be struck against the matchbook, right? You have to have that friction. And I'm sure in that moment of friction, it's not comfortable, but then the light appears, right? I know for me, the more my heart breaks, the more the light can shine through. You have to realize that situations you encounter in your life are surface events, meaning they occur on the surface of awareness, three-dimensional reality, in other words. Underneath the events themselves are vast unseen forces operating from deep within consciousness itself. This consciousness may be expressing through you, through your culture, through earth changes, and even through cosmic forces of unimaginable proportions. Not all events are created solely by you, although your perception of them most assuredly is. Various forces, forces individual, cultural, earth-based, and cosmic, interact to create the surface events of our and your destiny. Editor's notes. The presentation of the Osirian myth by the Hathors focuses solely on the struggle between Hath and Horus as aspects of human consciousness. It does not address one of the central figures of the myth, namely Isis, and her indispensable role in the resurrection of Osiris. When I asked the Hathors about this, they said they were isolating one piece of the myth as a vehicle to explain the struggle between good and evil, between truth and illusion that all humans have to deal with. Furthermore, their presentation of Set as a symbolic representation of Apollos and Horus as a symbolic representation of Mahat is highly unusual. This presentation is in stark contrast to how the myth is viewed by Egyptologists. When I asked the Hathors about this, they said that on the surface of things, it looks like a battle between Set and Horus, but at a deeper level, the battle was also between archetypal forces. We studied the archetypes in our Return of the Divine Sophia series. And honestly, like... I'll probably never be talking to an Egyptologist. I, I mean, mad respect for the amount of school you've gone through, but also you are super programmed. I just don't trust any type of scholastic profession at this point, be it medicine, be it educate, be it history, science. I just don't trust it because it's all coming from the same source of mind control. And we know nothing is what we think it is. Nothing. And so um, I probably would not, not even have a thought to ask an Egyptologist to look at this stuff because I've been, I mean, not to sound arrogant or anything, but at this point, those of us who are waking up are probably a lot smarter than the people who are still heavily. I mean, cult programming is everywhere, right? And that's what the cabal is. It's a cult. And so we have academic cults. I've said that there, of course, we think of like religious cults. I get attacked a lot from the fundamentalist, but I mean, wait till like the people that have history, PhDs in history realize 
that the history we taught is complete bullshit. Wait until they fi figure out Tartaria. You're going to see a mad explosion of either cognitive, ma massive cognitive dissonance or um, derangement and violence, realizing that they had been lied to for so long and have been teaching the lie. So I wouldn't even consider talking to Egyptologists. I mean, they still think that Egypt and Africa is actually Egypt. It's not. As one guy on his channel said, that's like, it's like the Egyptian amusement park. That's not the real Egypt. The real Egypt is here in the Southeast. Karma. Karma is cause and effect, right? It's your work. You can change your life by changing your thoughts and feeling patterns. There is karma, but karma is simply the law of reaction. Yes, all actions have reactions or consequences, and everything you do has an effect. Karmic results and effects will be positive where, when they are in the fruits of compassion and loving acts. Karma is simply experiencing the effects of your thoughts and actions with either positive or negative results. If you bring a negative karmic deck into a lifetime that needs to be transmuted or addressed, it can be dealt with externally in terms of events that seem to happen out of the blue. Or it can be dealt with energetically at the subtle realm and simply transmuted. This is what alchemy and yoga are about. Yep. We essentially encourage the transmutation of negative karma energetically in the subtle rounds. Then you won't have to work it out in your external affairs. No one is freed from the consequences of their action. All must be aware of it and deal with it. The consequences of what they do in this lifetime are others. Absolutely. Although there are a few YouTubers out there who claim to be truthers, but we know they're not because they're paid by the three-letter agency. I know this. Um, they seem to think that they don't have to follow the laws of karma, but they are sorely mistaken. I mean, look at what happened. I I'm doing really, I'm doing a lot of deep dives into Keith Ranieri again in Nexium because I have a guest coming on. And I was like going back over the timeline of Nexium and Keith Raniere. And I'm looking at all this bad shit, awful stuff he did to, to people for oh, many decades before karma caught up with him. But it eventually did. And now he's serving a 120 year prison sentence. So karma will always catch up with people. Always. If you're doing spell work on people that's dark and dirty it's going to come back to you and you as the recipient you don't really have to do anything to make that karma happen that's just cause and effect right defend yourself but there it's it's coming that's the laws of the universe whether you're serving the dark or the light it's cause and effect Car no one escapes karma no one However, the destiny that unfolds before you, i.e. your future, is a result of the seeds that are planted right now in this moment. What you choose to think and feel and what you choose to experience in terms of your reactions to the events of your life carries responsibility. What you choose in terms of thought and actions are seed that will, according to the impersonal law of the universe, unfold into karmic consequences in the future. So you are literally shaping your future destiny in this very moment. Your destiny does not passively wait for you. It is created by you in every moment of your life and every moment that you make choices. The karmic repercussions for civilizations operate on the same principles as it does for individuals. It's just more massive and there is more value variables involved because there are so many people. The destiny for the United States, as with the individual, is not something that ho hovers off in the future it is something that citizens are continually creating and shaping at every moment by the decisions they make as a culture as a society and so it is every and so is every country in the world and that's why i love in like the law of one and the cassiopeian they never use the word prophecy they always use the word probability we for some reason think prophecy we think something that's destined to happen and nothing is destined to happen because things are always changing and shifting and we still have the law of free will probability is a better word for that. There's a probability that this is going to happen, but because we're constantly co-creating the future, it's not set in stone. But karma is set in stone. There will always be a cause and an effect. You do something really shitty to someone, there's going to be a payment for that action. It might not be right now. It might be a year from now. It might be 10 years from now, but it will always come back and bite you in the ass. Always. 
They are karmic threads that run through current cultures of the United States, which are fruition of past actions as a country. Although the United States was formed with a vision of very high purpose, very high integrity, and a view of freedom for the individual that has radiated and uplifted the world to a great extent, it has also brought forth many negative situations. There are, neg uh, ne there are negativities of greed, violence, and dominion, and oppression of other cultures. History indicates that a culture or civilization cannot hold that positive that position indefinitely. Some of the decisions and the actions of the United States that have been led to negative consequences in the world must be balanced. Because those negativities must be balanced, healed, and a more loving attitude ac acquired, a very complex phenomenon is going on. The United States is paying its karmic debt, as all societies are, but the destiny for this particular country remains to be seen because it will be based on the choices that citizens make day by day. You are creating a legacy for your children and your children's children, as well as for future generations who will be forced to deal with the consequences of your choices you are making now. Nations are operating very much like individuals. They are territorial, possessive, and looking out for their own self-interest. There is not yet an understanding in the consciousness of the human race that a country can take care of itself while also being sensitive to the needs of other nations. Consequently, countries are in a various state of evolution, and there's no solid, heartfelt, international understanding. Those countries that are benevolent to others with their resources are obviously expressing a higher ideal than those countries that have resources that will not share them. And we also have to understand that we as the people are not our governments, because our governments have not been honoring our free will and our consent and they will have to pay for that that is the one thing you just do not do is is uh, violate someone's consent and um once consent is revoked and you continue to do that action your karma is going to be paid tenfold back to you and so we know with a lot of these competitions we'll say winners are picked that are not the true winners laws are passed that are not approved by the people um Taxes are used on things that the people did not approve taxes to be used for. And so what I think is going to happen is, is depending on what we continue to do as patriots, we'll continue that will we'll give us a better ideas of the future, whereas the government already has its own karmic debt to pay. We already know what's coming for the governments, but the people have their own path to continue to pay. So in my opinion, you know, I've, I've been very lucky. Traveled the world multiple times i think i've now been on every continent in the planet i've lived in multiple countries human beings are human beings cultures may be different but all human beings have empathy have compassion all hum most people are genuinely really good and they they want to help others they don't care where someone's from you know they don't label someone's value by what country they're from it's them as the person that's how most people are and so i do think for us as humanity we do have a bright future because we have been fighting hard for the freedoms and liberties of all. There is a volatile state of affairs within the former Soviet Union presently because no equilibrium has been established. The struggle between those aspects of consciousness that want to free the individual and allow a great personal expression are in polar opposition to forces that want to suppress the individual and bring society back to a higher level of control. A similar situation may develop in China. Because because communism is totally evil it's totally evil it's of the darkness because there are warning elements in consciousness that have not been refined or purified in many of the nations of the world one could say the war is not going to end in any foreseeable future unfortunately i think a lot of us feel like the end of this war it should be now but i think it's going to be probably a few more years that's just my opinion because it has i mean things are happening every day something's happening every day to shift us in the right direction don't get me wrong but I think it's going to take a few years for everything to play itself out. What we can say from our perspective, however, is that individuals are waking up all over this planet and every society and all levels and positions of those societies. As more and more individuals will wake up and recognize that certain things are not tolerable, that they simply cannot do things the way they did them before. And as these awakened people include individuals of power and influence, you will see societies begin to shift. It is starting now, but right now, now it is figuratively a tug of war between many of the forces and factors at all levels of society throughout the entire world 
we're seeing it. That's correct. We are seeing this tug of war, right? The war ain't over until it's over. Listen, if I know anything from the law of one about the darkness, they don't give up. They don't surrender. Okay. So don't be mistaken. Don't think that the cabal's gone. They don't surrender. They have to either be arrested or executed in order to stop. So this tug of war of, of polarity and friction will continue until it's done. You'll know when it's done. Societies are an unusual construct or structure, and if persons wish to influence society, it has been almost a set rule. The level of society you operate in determines the effects you will have. So those who have influence and are on levels of power and decision making have a greater impact on the machinery of society or the institutions individuals who have vision and personal power who are not part of the structure or the me me mechanism of the institutions however can still have a tremendous impact by virtue of their vision and personal power if you hold a frequency or a vibration of consciousness say as an emotional tone of peace and love this will set up a vibra vibratory field that is contagious then other people who are awake will also begin to do that same thing and when you have enough individuals holding a vibration, whether it is a fear or whether it is love, then you have a powerful effect on society. And I think that's a really great place to stop it on today because next week we'll pick up with intergalactic karma, which is all probably a lot more intense of an idea because I really want people to think about that. What did they say about love and about fear? How many truthers are out there pushing fear on you? If they're pushing fear on you, they're not, they're not of the light. It's about you understanding, making a choice of what side you're going to be on, lightness or dark, service to others or service to self, and then holding that. Stand up for what's right, do what's right, help others. And remember, we are all just walking each other home. If you want to continue to work on that, do the shadow work challenge. We have our 60 day shadow work challenge going on right now. If you have not signed up for that, and it's never too late, it's never too late to do the work, you can email me at the email address listed in the description box below. All right, you guys, I hope you have a wonderful day. I will talk to you soon.